Here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, I've been involved in identifying genomic or genetic defects in childhood cancer. The difference is that most people have focused on the so-called genes that everyone thinks of that make proteins. We, in contrast, have been looking at all the rest of the genome where the genes there don't make proteins and no one knows anything about them. But what we've discovered is that they are extremely powerful biomarker profiles, for example, that can predict what will happen to a patient. And most recently, we've discovered that they are also potential therapeutic targets. This is extremely important. It's unique to humans. And not surprisingly, this so-called regulatory network is actually, therefore, critically important to health and disease. Well, thank you. And um, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you about a relatively arcane topic. And I have to confess at the outset that I don't have a Corey to talk about it, because unfortunately, ours is far more uh, preclinical than that. This is really at the translational stage. Uh, I'll tell you up front that what I hope I can do is leave you uh, with uh, a knowledge that perhaps many of you have not been aware of, that is the world of non-coding RNA and why you should care about it, because it's actually quite important. Um, by way of disclosure, I should also mention that um, the uh, delivery technology that we'll be talking about is part of a joint development effort between Nanovalent Pharmaceuticals and um, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and I helped found Nanovalent. And also, one of the diagnostic tools has been licensed to a company called Intergen for diagnosis of childhood cancer. So with that, let me uh, begin to explain. I think to set the stage, I'd like to point out that uh, despite some of the rosy developments of the 80s and 90s in the increasing uh, the improved outcomes for childhood cancer survival, the situation, unfortunately, hasn't changed much for the last couple of decades. Um, this slide uh, shows, uh, provided by Doug Hawkins, a uh, head of the disease uh, committee, sarcoma disease committee and children's oncology group, shows the outcome of three major phase three clinical trials over the past couple of decades. And I think as you can appreciate, there's no difference. And that is a problem that bedevils much of pediatric oncology where we really haven't seen a tremendous change in outcomes, not surprisingly, because we really don't have that many new drugs, if any. We don't really have new targets. And unfortunately, uh, there have been few, in fact, none uh, of these new innovative phase three trials like you see in adult cancer. Not surprisingly, the result is that we really don't have much difference in outcomes. But at the same time, we've acquired the unfortunate baggage of the intensive chemotherapy that we give these patients, which includes lifetime morbidity and increased mortality. And underlying all this is a fundamental problem that we really don't understand a lot more about childhood cancer than we did before. Fortunately, um, there have been a couple of initiatives, and the work I'll present today is actually the result of some NCI-supported large-scale genomic profiling trials that were supported uh, over the past decade. Out of that work came an interesting observation, unexpected, I might note. When we began to look at the transcriptional profile, that is, all the RNA that's actually expressed by a cell, in childhood cancer especially, and by the way, during development, and not so much in adult cancer, it turns out that the vast majority of transcripts are actually non-coding. They do not encode for a protein. And this universe of non-coding RNA is enormous. Uh, whereas there are about 20,000 transcripts for the human genome that encode for protein, People argue about the numbers, but somewhere between 80,000 and 300,000 transcripts encode nothing. But however, when you think about it, Mother Nature is not stupid. There is a reason why we carry this baggage. It is, in fact, highly functional and highly relevant, potentially, to things like diagnosis and therapy. So at the time this was first uh, noted five years ago, there was a lot of controversy, a lot of uh, pushback that, in fact, this was just random noise in the genome. It didn't really mean anything. So we spend a great deal of time trying to prove that to the contrary. <clears throat> this next slide is a little technical, and I'll try to explain it quickly, but the blue dots represent non-coding transcripts. The red dots represent coding uh, transcripts that will ultimately become protein. The graph on the left shows, if you will, on the uh, vertical axis, the magnitude, or in other words, the level of expression, and the horizontal axis is actually the statistical significance of association with only one tumor type. And the upper right-hand quadrant is, happens to be Ewing sarcoma, a tumor of interest to us. And the lower left is, in fact, a number of other similar childhood cancers. I think you can easily appreciate that the world of non-coding RNA is a lot larger than coding RNA. And most importantly, in terms of magnitude, in other words, level of expression, and statistical significance, the non-coding RNA vastly outclasses the coding RNAs. 
And if you pick some of the number one on the hit parade, that's something called FECF1 antisense in the extreme upper right hand corner, and look at the levels of expression, it's expressed tenfold higher than any coding gene, number one on that parade being ENPP3, which is the most highly expressed gene that pro encodes protein in Ewing sarcoma. You look at this and you realize there's a lot there, and it's very, very exclusive to this tumor type. And this is only one example of many, by the way. You then translate that into, for example, how does that compare to all human cancer? This is 800 human tumors on the left-hand panel, and the only one expressing this transcript is the Ewing sarcoma. So now you have something that is exquisitely specific for one tumor type. And that, as shown in the right-hand panel, can be do documented to only be expressed in that type of childhood cancer and thus became the basis of a test that was ultimately commercialized for the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma. And this again is only one of many examples that we've developed over the years that could be utilized as very precise tumor diagnostics. But that begets the question, if it's so specific, does it in fact have a function? So after a great deal of work, and by the way, there we go, we began to ask the question, how would we potentially employ this to document that in fact it was not only functional, but that we could utilize it? So this led to the notion that if we really wanted to modulate this, we would end up having to use so-called, I think we've skipped a slide, by the way. Could we go back one slide? Um, yes, and go back one more slide. <laughs> there, okay, so now let's go forward. So we began to document that this thing was functional, and uh, for example, if we modulate the expression of this transcript and use it in the model system of Ewing sarcoma, in the left-hand panel, you see low-level expression. In the right-hand panel, you see high-level expression of this transcript only. And as you can appreciate, the signal as seen in the, uh, this uh, imaging study shows that the tumors are larger and actually many more of them and high, more highly metastatic. In other words, this transcript appears to promote tumor growth and metastasis, precisely the thing that leads to the death ultimately of these patients. So the thought occurred, how could we possibly modulate this? And it turns out that we can not only upregulate it, but we can downregulate it using something called antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs. That then leads to the problem because ASOs are not a normal therapeutic. They are a potential means of uh, targeting uh, for therapeutic purposes this class of RNA but how would you get it to the tumor? And that led to the development of the technology that I've mentioned, specifically the use of a uh, sort of a current generation of highly synthetic um, hybrid uh, polymerized liposomal nanoparticles, or HPLNs as we call them. They differ from typical liposomes in that they are synthetic in part. They're very similar to a very popular drug called Doxel, but unlike Doxel, they are targeted. On the surface, we have developed a technology for specifically binding whatever you want, peptides, um, or in this case, monoclonal antibodies, and in this particular case, human monoclonal antibodies against the target of choice. As a result of these same genomic studies I referenced as part of these NCI studies um, over the years, we've identified specific targets on most of the human tumors that could be used to deliver these nanoparticles to those tumors. As an example, in the next slide, you can see that when you target the tumor cells, over 90% of the drug is within 15 minutes taken up by the tumor cells. If you don't target them, as seen in the two panels on the left and in the uh, bar chart, very little of the drug is actually taken up by the tumor cells. And if you think about it, Doxel is probably a, a easily a billion dollar a year plus drug that if it were tar targeted might be far more effective. And in fact, we've done those studies to compare. <clears throat> if you look, this is a comparative analysis of free doxorubicin, for example, versus a conventional liposome uh, versus uh, on the extreme left there, the uh, targeted uh, nanoparticle. Uh, in this particular case, if you notice, the so-called IC50, the concentration that you need to show efficacy, is reduced on the order of 80-fold if you use the targeted nanoparticles. So the idea of delivering agent with, in a targeted manner then is very, pop very important. And this is really relevant because the trouble with ASOs is that they have a relatively short biologic half-life and they're not inexpensive small molecules to make. So you don't want to waste them by delivering them systemically and having them diluted out to the entire body when all you really want to do is deliver them specifically to the tumor cells. So by doing so, we've actually been able to show in another model, for example, of leukemia where it's CD19 targeted, a very popular target for leukemia, 
that in fact you can virtually ablate the leukemia, which otherwise is not the case. In this model of childhood ALL, for example, in the lower panel on the left, you can see animals that have been treated with doxorubicin in CD19 targeted nanoparticles, and you see a very dramatic uh, reduction in tumor mass and also actually indefinite survival. The animals survive until they have to be sacrificed. So we knew that the system worked well for conventional small molecules. <clears throat> the question is, what about Ewing sarcoma? And so, uh, and by the way, I wanted to note as an aside that you know, normally when you give this level of chemotherapy, there are dramatic, un unfortunate side effects with elevated liver enzymes, decreased renal function, and bone marrow suppression. None of that occurs when you use these targeted nanoparticles. So you can see here the normal serum chemistries and so forth. In the case of Ewing sarcoma, you can use CD19, a universally expressed target in Ewing sarcoma, and here you can see dramatic tumor uptake by these same nanoparticles, thus showing that we could deliver agent of choice to Ewing tumor cells specifically. And we went on to do this now with human monoclonal anti-CD99 uh, targeted nanoparticles, again like delivering noxorubicin, you see again a dramatic reduction in tumor burden and uh, very little um, tumor growth and actually prolonged survival, not shown here which takes us to the point of where we go next with this technology, and specifically, we now have begun a series of studies whereby we have encapsulated this particular ASO that is specific for this particular long non-coding RNA, if you see F1, antisense, and have already shown in vitro with free agent, and now uh, in a series of studies underway, are doing the same thing to show that you can get enormous suppression, actually complete obliteration of the expression of this transcript for upwards of 24 hours, and then with a return within roughly 48 hours, as shown in the left panel, which concordantly, by the way, results in a dramatic reduction in tumor growth. And that leads to the idea that this then could be delivered therapeutically with no toxicity in a highly efficient manner, which is where we're going with the technology. So I'd like to leave you with the thought that if nothing else, non-coding RNA is important, it's functional, and it's a potential target for therapy, particularly if you have this delivery technology. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much.